It's a pleasure to welcome Simone to Network Capital. He's written uh, one of the most interesting books that I've read that nudges us to redefine our relationship with work. Today, we're going to talk more about his career, some of the points that he highlights in the book, and uh, how did a workaholic write a case against uh, work? So that'll be you know, the focus of our discussion. So Simone, tell us a bit about yourself. How did you become a writer? Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've had like a meandering career. I've worked in four, five different industries and you know, I'm in my mid thirties. So I've done a lot of, uh, of wandering in my day. In college, I studied poetry and economics. So maybe that tells you everything you need to know. There was sort of this <laughs> tension between art and commerce in my early life. And out of college, I, I moved back to San Francisco where I'm from. I joined the advertising industry worked in advertising, and then I worked in food for a few years, and then I worked in tech, and then I eventually became a journalist. But the sort of first impetus for the book, the first kind of kernel of an idea of what would eventually become a good enough job was a moment of career transition for me. Hmm. I'd been working in magazines, working um, as, a, as a news reporter, and I was reached out to by a recruiter from a design agency called IDEO. And, you know, on one hand, I, I realized there's a certain, like, I don't expect much pity, you know, the agony of deciding between two potentially uh, attractive career paths. But on the other hand, it really kind of threw me for a loop, you know, deciding between these two paths of design mm -hmm. and journalism, really made me question sort of how I had attached my identity to my career. It didn't feel like I was choosing between two jobs as much as it felt like I was choosing between two versions of me. And so I was doing all this questioning of like, am I still a real writer if that's not the sort of thing that I'm spending most of my time doing for my day job? And these questions of like how work and identity became so entwined was really the first um the first research prompt that eventually led to the book. Yeah. So the book was initially a side project, right? So what nudged you to discover or add more to your already busy schedule? And how did you sort of figure it out? Yeah, I mean, you're touching on kind of the key irony of the book, which is it's a book about our culture of overwork, of sort of work centricity. And yet I was writing the majority of it on the side of a full-time job. Um, as you might imagine, you know, I do a fair amount of wrestling with that over in, in the pages of the book and thinking about, you know, what is my role in being sort of the shepherd of this story. And, you know, I think for me, I don't want to position myself as someone who has all the answers. You know, I think the our relationship to work is not fixed, nor should we want it to be. I think it's by wrestling with our relationship to work that we get to figure out what we care about. So whether you're a recent college graduate or you're considering a career transition or you're entering retirement, whatever phase of life that you're in, the introspection required in order to figure out whether you want to work to live or live to work or how much of your time or how much money is important to you. That is sort of the rich stuff that I think really gets mm. to the heart of what you value and what you care about as a person. Got it. Can you connect the dots between uh, workism, America, and religion? Yeah. So I think, you know, the way that I frame it in the book is that uh, workism, which is this term that was coined by a colleague of mine named Derek Thompson, is uniquely American in some ways because of the culture of work in the U.S. You know, here we treat CEOs like celebrities. The, what do you do is often the first question that people ask when they meet each other. But one of the main sort of origins of all of this has been the decline of other sources of meaning and identity in Americans' lives and organized religion being a prime example. So in the 1950s, the sort of peak of religiosity in America, about 6% of Americans didn't associate with religion. The vast majority had some sort of religious institution, whether it was their local mosque or church or synagogue, that gave them a, both a source of identity, but also community and meaning and purpose. And since, say, the last 50 years or so, since the 1970s, 
there's been a pretty precipitous decline of religiosity in the U.S. You know, there's a lot of different explanations or reasons for why organized religion has fallen out of favor, but the result is that that thirst for for meaning and belonging and purpose and community remains. And I make the case that many Americans have turned to their jobs to fulfill those roles that religion once played in their life. Yeah. And that fascinated me so much because, you know, the same experience or same goods that people once got out of religion, uh, in a way, they're now trying to find it through work. Some are succeeding, many are failing, and your book sort of captures that tension and explains that tension through characters. Could you tell us about how you pick these characters and how do you find these stories that will help our audience? Yeah, of course. So the, for, the form of the book is that each chapter follows a different worker in a different industry. And so there's a Michelin star chef, and there, there is a librarian, and there is a Wall Street banker, and there is a software engineer at Google who lives in a van in the Google parking lot, just to name a few. And through each of their stories, I explore a particular theme. So for example, the software engineering chapter is about where we work. It's about the office. The Wall Street banker chapter is about status and success and money and sort of why do we seek these totems of prestige. And the reason I did that is because for me, narrative is really the way that ideas stick in my mind. You know, maybe this is part of my bias as a as a magazine reporter, but I love to learn through people's stories and through the specificity of their stories, I was able to reflect on my own relationship to work. And I think, you know, for me, there's aspect of aspects of each of their stories that really resonate with my own working experience. And I hope the same will be true for you. And I think part of, you know, what is hard about our relationship to work is that it feels like such an individual struggle. You know, you might not be in the same <clears throat> line of work as your family and friends and might not be able to relate to exactly what you're going through. And so often we're sort of on these islands trying to figure out our relationship to work just, you know, in our heads. But through reading through these other stories or reporting in my case, it was very validating to some of the struggles that I was going through and actually helped me heal some of the, say, traumas that I have from my past working experiences. Yeah. You know, one of the papers that uh, I read very carefully in Oxford was uh, a case against work by this philosopher called John Danner. And the next I read was your book, which is also a case against work, but uh, coming from a more practical perspective from somebody who's actually worked in business. Both are interesting takes, but it's very easy to misunderstand what you're saying. So mm -hmm. before we dive into specifics, can you, can you basically explain what you're not saying and what you're basically encouraging the reader to do as he or she redefines her work relationship? Yeah, of course. And I'm really glad you asked that question. I think, you know, even just looking at like the the cover and the title of my book, you know, The Good Enough Job, Reclaiming Life from Work, you might think that it's a book that is anti-work, that it thinks that work is a necessary evil that we must toil through, and there is no meaning or purpose or identity to be found from work. And that's not the case that I'm making. The case really stems from this idea that actually has its origins in the UK. This pediatrician and psychoanalyst named Donald Winnicott. And in, in the 1950s, uh, mid 20th century, Winnicott devised this theory called the good enough mother, or more broadly, good enough parenting. And what Winnicott was observing was there was this growing idealization of parenting where the mothers specifically would try and shield their kids from experiencing any harm or negative emotions. And then when the kid eventually inevitably felt frustrated or sad or angry, the, the parent internalized those feelings. They took it extremely personally. Mm -hmm. And Winnicott argued for the value of valuing sufficiency over perfection. He thought it could actually benefit both the child and the parent. The kid would learn how to self-soothe and take care of some of them, their own problems. And the parent wouldn't sort of lose themselves and their own identities and, and their kids' feelings. And so I'm making the parallel to the working world where there's been this growing idolization of work, of thinking about the dream job or this one sort of perfect vocational soulmate that will help you self-actualize and be, you know, the fullest version of yourself. And 
I am like Winnicott advocating for taking an approach of first thinking about what is your sort of vision of a life well lived, and then how can your job or your career support that vision, as opposed to the other way around, which is sort of we start with the job in the center, and then we sort of squeeze the other elements of our lives into the margins. And so, you know, one of my favorite things about the, the framework is that, you know, the, the term good enough is like intentionally subjective. For you, maybe good enough means making a certain amount of money or working in a certain industry or having a certain title or getting off work at a certain hour so you can pick up your kids from elementary school or go to your band practice where a lot of meaning is found in your life. Whatever your definition of good enough is, I want you to, to recognize when you have it. And so the, the case that I'm making is really about the value of diversifying the sources of identity and meaning in your life. I don't think it's necessarily problematic to look to work for meaning or purpose or identity, but as so many people found out during the pandemic, it can be a, a perilous game when it's the, the sole source of identity or meaning in your life. Yeah, that's a really important point to sort of unbundle your identity uh, from, the, from, from your working relationship. And it's easier said than done. But in the book, you talk about some of the more practical tips and eight or nine case studies through these uh, stories that you tell. Um, can you explain what is the one thing that you've done which has most helped you unbundle your identity from the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, it may sound simplistic, but if we want to have other identities other than work, we must do things other than work. You know, I think identities are sort of like plants. They require attention and energy in order to grow. And so in order to sort of water these different identities in our lives, we must give them our attention. And so I think for me, you know, it's very closely correlated with our activities and our behavior. You know, one of the risks of such a work-centric existence is that we don't just give our jobs our best hours but our best energy too and then it's no wonder why you know after a long work day sometimes all you can do is come home and turn on netflix to try and turn your brain off but if you want to actually cultivate other sources of identity in your life you actually have to have active forms of leisure you have to go out into the world and have your identities reinforced by different communities that say don't care about what you do for your job or how you perform in your last performance review. So one example for me is I, I like to play pickup soccer. And you know, there's obviously like aerobic and exercise benefits of playing a recreational sport. But I think one of the, the greatest benefits for me is it's this community of people that could care less about what I do for work. Like what they care about mm. is how well I can, you know, pass and show up as a teammate and defend collectively. And, you know, I think there's a few important parts of that. One is it's an identity that keeps me from working while I'm doing it. So like while you're mm. playing in a sports game or exercising, it's this kind of structural barrier to continuing to tap out one more email or having your work brain turned off, which is, I think the status quo for so many people, we're always sort of in this state of half working where we're like, sharks sleeping with one eye open and like one eye always on our email inbox or our Slack or Microsoft Teams notifications. And the other mm. aspect of it is that I think our identities are very much reinforced by others. And so, mm. you know, I have this cohort of folks who know me as a striker. They don't know me as a journalist or as an author or as a writer. They don't mm. care how many views my last article got or how many books I sold. What they care about is my identity in this different context of the team. And so I don't think that like playing recreational sports is the only means to this end, but I encourage you to think about how you can find communities in your life. You know, I think family is a great one, groups of friends, different vessels or containers for these different identities that you hold. Yeah. Um, in your book, you also talk about your relationships, one with your mentor and one with your partner. And both of them seem to be very special and have helped you take important decisions. Uh, could you tell us about 
both of their roles in your career and how it has shaped the book? Yeah, so I'm, I'm lucky to have a few mentors. Um, one of them is uh, another author. His name is Robin Sloan. And I remember coming to him in this very particular moment of my career where I had been working in tech for a few years and I was considering going back to graduate school to pursue a degree in journalism. And, you know, unlike law or medicine, a degree is not a prerequisite in order to, to be a journalist. You can just start writing or try and get hired for, at, a, at a newsroom or a publication. But I wanted sort of the, the credential. I, I don't know, my parents are both psychologists. They both have advanced degrees. Sort of going to graduate school just felt like something that people in my family did. Um, hmm. And so I applied to a few schools and then I was admitted, and it was only then that I had started questioning whether I actually wanted to, to go back to school or not. And so I, I got coffee with, with Robin, and he asked me a question that I'll, I'll never forget. He asked me, if you could get what you supposedly want, but you couldn't tell anyone about it, would you still want it? And it was such a profound question for me in my life because it made me tap into my intrinsic motivation, what sort of I was motivated by that wasn't about external rewards or recognition, but what I truthfully deep down in, in my core wanted. And, you know, I ended up going to graduate school. I'm, I'm glad that I did. I, I'm not saying this to be prescriptive of any particular path, but I think the important thing is that he made me connect with my values and what was unique to me, as opposed hmm. to inheriting the values of either the people around me or the market around me. You know, I think a common trap that a lot of recent graduates fall into is they start by thinking about questions like what you can get paid most to do. Um, and, you know, that might drive some people to become software engineers or, or doctors or attorneys or what have you. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with any of those paths or any of those careers. But what's missing from that equation is also thinking about what you yourself value. I think there's danger on either end. If you're only valuing what the market values, it can leave you in a position where you're, say, climbing a career ladder that you don't actually want to be on, or you're trying to mm. you're trying to win a game that you don't actually enjoy playing. But if you're on the other end of the spectrum and you're only valuing what you value without considering what the market values, it can be dangerous as well. It can leave you in a precarious position where, for example, you're taking on lots of debt to pursue an advanced degree that might not actually lead to job prospects on the other end, or it might drive you to be an artist, but you're so preoccupied by how you're going to pay rent that you can't actually focus on the art that you want to be creating. And so I think the sweet spot is thinking about how you can marry those two, how you can think about mm. sort of the intersection of the Venn diagram of what the market values and what you value and try and find a line of work that holds both of those in account. Right. And there are many phrases. Japanese have a concept, ikigai. There are poets and philosophers who have nudged us to figure this out. And this is surprisingly never taught in schools and colleges. In schools mm. and colleges, no matter what you write in your graduate application form, you end up in the hallowed halls of consulting and banking and what have you. And I think people should read your book to see what happens uh, if you get there too soon. Um, but, you know, we are all in a very precarious situation. So um, the people who say that it's, it, it's the best time to be working, it's the best time to be alive, they say that working conditions in the past were so bad. People didn't make any money. It was unsafe. The jobs were boring. So this is more of a luxury that we have today because on average, people are richer, things are better. So we are complaining. But I think it's, uh, it's too simplistic to say that. But do you feel that it's still a good time to be working and uh, have broadly conditions of work become better than the past? Than perhaps when your grandma was working in the cafe that you talk about? Yeah, I think yes and no. Um, I think for the majority of people, 
working conditions have gotten better. You know, the shift from more industrial jobs to more knowledge-based jobs, the shift from a economy without organized labor to an economy with worker protections, the sort of availability of many jobs that are now at people's fingertips thanks to the the growth of remote work and the internet. There are lots of things about working in today's world that the farmers of the 18th and 19th centuries could not imagine. And yet I think there's a lot of aspects of that optionality or that choice that can be really psychically damaging to workers when, for example, everyone is parading their professional accomplishments around for the world to see on social media. And there's this feeling of like, am I keeping up when there's this pressure to monetize, you know, every minute of your day and turn your hobby into a side grind or just to find a job that you feel as cool in the eyes of your peers and respectable in the eyes of your parents and aligns with your own values, it can be a tall order. In many ways, the expectations for what work can deliver have never been higher. And with those sky high expectations come the potential for disappointment. You know, I often like thinking about the, the difference between expectations and reality as being the formula for happiness. And so, you know, what I would encourage you to do as you are wrestling with some of these topics of of work and life is to try and and zoom out a little bit. You know, I think one of the benefits of diversifying the sources of of meaning and identity in your life is it takes off some of the the pressure. You know, if you are equating your self-worth with your performance in the workplace and your boss or your manager gives you a piece of negative feedback, it can really spill over into to all aspects of your life unless there are other sources of validation and worth and meaning and community that you have. At the most extreme example is what we've seen during the pandemic where you know millions of workers worldwide were either laid off or furloughed often by no fault of their own. And you know, I think, the the risk of a work centric existence was on full display. Do you have thoughts on the great resignation uh, that happened during the pandemic and how that changed things? Yeah, I think you know these terms like the great resignation and quiet quitting. In some ways, they can be memes, you know, and and lose some of their their meaning. And in in other ways, the Great Resignation signified a a massive shift. I think there's a common misconception with the Great Resignation that that believes that the majority of workers just sort of were quitting their jobs so that they could sit on their couch and, you know, go to Thailand and just be on vacation forever. But in actuality, you know, the trend of the Great Resignation was many workers leaving their jobs to find better work, to find work that supported their lifestyles better, find work that allowed them to be more present with their children, to find work that, that frankly, paid better. You know, And I think it's important to sort of separate some of the reasons why people work when you think about the sort of economy and the different spectrum of folks within it. On one hand, you have people, which represents the majority of people, who are working to live, working to survive. Um, you know, the even the question of what do I want to do necessitates a certain level of a privilege to be asking. Um, and then there's the sort of chattering class, or maybe what I'd refer to as like the educated elite that are looking into work for self-actualization. But I think what the Great Resignation really showed is with just a, a modicum of social support from the government and a opportunity to spend t- more time at home with the people that we love and uh, the space to reflect on what role we want work to have in our lives, many people were able to change course 
and to find work that better aligned with who they wanted to be. Understood. And you talk about universal basic income in a very interesting way. Can you tell us a bit about how UBI plays a role in, or how might it play a role in uh, designing jobs in the future? Yeah, so, you know, what I, what I write in the book is that I am less interested in UBI as a policy as much as UBI as a stance that says that our basic human needs should not be tied to our employment status. We should decouple our survival from our sort of W-2 in the U.S. W-2 is sort of the full-time employment status designation. And so one of the things that we've seen in a lot of the UBI trials that have happened in different parts of the world is that it doesn't actually decrease people's drive to work. You know, one of the main sort of critiques of UBI is that if everyone is receiving, you know, free cash each month, they're just going to become lazy and they're not going to work. And, you know, there was a study in, in Stockton, California, not far from where I am um, in San Francisco, and it showed that people that received the monthly stipend actually found full-time work at a higher rate than a control group that didn't receive that monthly stipend. Mm -hmm. And I think it's analogous to a lot of the sort of increases in unemployment benefits that Americans saw in the pandemic with this just little added element of social support and safety, people were able to leave jobs that weren't good enough for them. I think this is a particularly poignant point in the US where, you know, I think part of the reason why our relationship to work is so fraught here is because the consequences of losing work are so mm -hmm. dire when, for example, your healthcare is tied to your employment status. And so I think UBI is an example of one way in which a more robust social safety net or more robust social support can actually help people find better jobs and become not just better humans, but better workers as well. Do you want to tell us a bit about um, how you see the, you know, the future of jobs emerging as passion economy becomes more mainstream and people sort of start of monetizing their side hustles and just creating jobs, which are very much at the intersection of uh, passion and profession. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I predict is that there are just going to be a lot more different scripts for how you can build a career. I think, you know, growing up, I'm a, I'm a millennial in my mid 30s, sort of smack dab in the middle of the millennial generation. I inherited certain scripts from my parents and from society about what it means to be uh, a good worker. And often that meant the the professions, you know, going to graduate school and doing a very particular type of specialization and then joining a company or a firm and working for that firm until you get some alphabet soup of credentials after your name, like VP or CEO. <laughs> yeah. And that was what success meant. And I think what we're seeing with the rise of the passion economy and freelancing and remote work is that there are lots of other ways to have a quote unquote successful <laughs> career. You know, I think one of the the great ironies is that when we when we think of someone as successful, we often don't mean that they are healthy or or happy or mm -hmm. feel a sense of belonging in their lives. We mean that they made a lot of money. And I think in the future, there are both going to be many different paths for people to make money, but there will also be many different ways for people to treat work as more of a means to an end, to work the amount of hours that gives them the amount of income that allows them to support their life and their lifestyle, and not necessarily just be putting in FaceTime or showing up to a job for the sake of proving to others that surely you must be working hard. Right. Um, what are status games, uh, Simone? Status games are, you know, it's, it's not a term that I've coined by any means, but they 
are those different totems of prestige that we chase in our life. So you can think about one status game is the game of getting into a prestigious university like Oxford, for example. You can think of another status game as a way of uh, working for a well-known company like a, like a Google or a, a McKinsey. You can think of another status game of, of earning a certain title, like um, you know, becoming the youngest ever managing director of your particular group. And you know, similar to the, the story I told earlier about that conversation with my mentor, I think these different statuses, they, they represent a, a sort of externally validated ambition. They're this way of demarcating that you have made it or that you are worthy or that you are successful in the, the eyes of others. You know, the, the journalist David Brooks has this great term that he uses called resume virtues. They're the type of things that you can you know, show on a resume. And what Brooks argues is actually we should be investing and spending more time thinking about the the eulogy virtues, you know, the things that might show up at your your funeral, you know. And I think like that is the risk of of chasing these these totems of status is that they can obscure what it is that you actually want instead of having to wrestle with what you value or what you hold to be important in your life, you can sort of outsource your deliberation by just choosing to chase these things that other people deem as as prestigious. Um, and you know, I, I I don't think that status in and of itself is problematic. You know, I think having standards of excellence can be a great motivator. It can inspire people to work hard. And yet, I think only valuing those external markers of status can be at a great cost when it forces us to um, not have to think about what it is that we actually care about. I was wondering uh, if you want to tell us a bit about uh, ambition and our redefined relationship with work. Because one theory is that, you know, this, uh, this, intense work environment made sure that everyone brought their best jp morgan goldman sachs etc are constantly talking about the work ethic of analysts and associates and so forth that allows them to you know uh, do work in a certain way um do you feel that ambition would change as people uh, start working on their terms rather than the terms defined by the industry or the company yeah, that's a great question. I think we're having this sort of society-wide conversation right now about ambition and a lot of the questions around quiet quitting or sort of work ethic really get to the heart of what it is to be ambitious. I think my perspective is that in the future, ambition will be targeted in different realms beyond our careers. I think often people are asking you know, whether ambition is good or bad. And I actually think that's the wrong question. I think the right question is where to be ambitious. And mm -hmm. you know, it's very clear of how you can be ambitious in your career. You can try and shoot up the organization chart. You can try and make lots of money. But what I foresee is that there will be greater value placed on being ambitious about other realms of your life. How can you be ambitious about the type of friend you are? How can you be ambitious about the way in which you show up for your family or for your loved ones? Is there value in being ambitious about the way in which you, say, put together your home or show up for your local neighborhood or community? You know, ambition, in my mind, is just having a a goal of having something that you're working towards that maybe is, is bigger than yourself. And so I don't think ambition in and of itself is problematic, as long as we're having an expansive definition about what we can be ambitious about. Understood. Uh, you have recently changed your relationship with work, you did quit your job. Uh, tell us about your anxiety levels, uh, your <laughs> new books coming out. There's a lot going right. on here. Yeah, yeah, very triggering question. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that <laughs> it's it's very interesting because in many ways I 
and my own case study. You know, I, I'm, I'm writing this book about right-sizing work's place in our lives. And recently I started working for myself. And I think there's been, there's been two sides to it. On one hand, I've really been able to benefit from the added levels of autonomy and agency I have and the lack of sort of meetings or other responsibilities um, in my new sort of working life. And I found that I am also often my own worst manager. You know, it is me mm -hmm. that is cracking the whip to drive myself to hit my weekly word goals or me that gets to own all of my own successes and all of my own failures. You know, I think one of the, the main arguments of the book is about the value of separating our self-worth from our work or our output. And yet, you know, like my name is like on the bottom of this book, you know, I'm about to put something out into the world that feels like my identity is, is very much tied to. And so as opposed to just thinking about it at a sort of intellectual level and being like, separate your self-worth from your work, separate your self-worth from your work, I actually think the best antidote is to just find other realms of worth and meaning in my life. You know, similar to the recreational soccer game that doesn't care about, you know, how many words I wrote that day or how many copies of the book it sold, how can I be intentional intentional about diversifying the sources of meaning in my life so that even though I might get my 15 minutes of fame and do interviews with, you know, esteemed professors like yourself, there will also be ways in which I am not necessarily centering myself or my own ego in how I'm deriving meaning from my life. Yeah. You know, before I begin to wrap up, I want to touch upon two questions that uh, you don't directly talk about in your book, and they are relating to envy in social network. So mm -hmm. when you're working for yourself, when you've redefined uh, your relationship with, uh, with what you do, uh, have you looked at what happens to envy? Do people still compare themselves with their peers? Um, and the other aspect of it is that uh, you and other people who sort of quit their job and went in a different direction, did you find them uh, sort of with a certain sense of regret that they've fallen behind their peers and, and instead of being managing director at 35, they're probably you know, doing something completely different? Yeah. You know, I'm wary to give prescriptive advice that might no. This is apply, more of a apply to experiment only if you've come across this. Question. Of course, yeah. I mean, I think the envy question is is definitely true and very salient in my life. I think a good analogy is thinking about um, the world of dating and maybe 200 or 300 years ago, if you lived in a small town or a small village, the dating pool was, you know, the potential partners or mates that were around your age in your small village. And now in a globalized world, you have an app on your phone that gives you a seemingly endless supply of other potential partners. And so the opportunity cost of any particular date you go on or partner you choose can be astronomically high if you let it because you can compare it to all of the seemingly perfect other options that exist out there. And I think the same is true in our in our careers, you know. Whereas maybe there were a dozen or two viable career options for um, people in our, our grandparents' position, now there are you know thousands of different paths that you can choose, and especially in the sort of creator economy, like you know millions of different gigs that you can try and look for to make money. And so I think the challenge is like how can you cultivate a sense of, of presence, of, of sufficiency with what you have. And that doesn't have to come at the expense of being aspirational about where you're going, but rather than direct your energy to what else might be out there or whether you could be doing better, trying to be mindful about every step of the way is sort of the best way of counteracting some of the envy that is inevitable that you'll you'll feel in your your day-to-day -day life you know I think you know it's easy to get into this mindset of comparison and if I'm doing better than John or Jim but really our careers are are a game with ourselves you know they are much more 
individualistic. We're all on our own path. We're all on our own journey, even if something is working very well for someone that you know, or a friend of yours, or someone that you see on LinkedIn, you can only compare their outsides to your insides. You know, it's not apples and and, and it, it is apples and oranges. And so that's, you know, the way that I, I think about envy and, and social comparison, to be honest, like I, one thing I'm not envious of is the, the youngest generation of people entering the workforce right now, where there is so much capitalism that has been infused into even the ways in which we spend our free time, like the, the social platforms on, on TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram, you know, you can be going from seeing a, a picture of your friend having a nice day at the park to five tips to make $5,000 tomorrow. Five to, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it's it's hard not to internalize some of these messages that we're hearing. But, you know, what what I would remind people is just to to run your own race, you know, be clear about what you care about and what you value and don't try and win someone else's game. Got it, got it. Um, just and uh, on the social network aspect of it, did you feel that uh, your parents or your partner or the parents and partners and friends or the people that you study, did they freak out? Did uh, the characters in your book have to do a lot of explaining to their inner circle, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I think like, in in many ways, the the non traditional paths are becoming more legible to other people. You know, if I told my parents, for example, when I was eighteen, that when I grew up I wanted to be a freelance writer, you know, they they might have looked at me as if I were trying to join the circus or you know become a a, a filmmaker that specialized in you know early twentieth century French cinema. You know, this like very particular and potentially not lucrative path. But I think, you know, what this age of social networks has shown is that there are, there is more acceptance for folks that choose different ways to, to make money. You know, there is, even if we're just thinking in purely business terms, there can be a lot of potential financial or lifestyle upside to taking a path that isn't for a traditional corporation that has existed for a hundred years. And I think people are are softening to the idea that, you know, there are more careers or ways to earn a living in this world other than, you know, the professions that um, have been revered in the past. And then I think the other side of it is a greater acceptance that our job is not the entirety of who we are, that a job is maybe part of your identity. It's maybe part of your sources of meaning. But at the end of the day, the thing that we need our work to do is to pay us enough money in order to live. Um, it can certainly do more than that. It can be a source of, of community or purpose or identity or meaning, but there's nothing, like it's just as noble to pursue a path where work is more of a means to an end. Thank you for uh, writing this book. Um, it really made a lot of sense to me. I don't know if I told you, in the middle of the pandemic, I quit my job at Microsoft. I moved countries. I made my passion project my full-time career. And here I am. So far, so good. Uh, still standing. And it's been fun. So I could relate to many aspects of your book. And like you, I also enjoy the, what I do very much. But that brings about a different kind of a challenge. So the relatability was very high. And interestingly, my second book is titled Passion Economy and the Side Hustle Revolution. So I'm asking everyone to look at their passions, convert their passions into possible careers and get out of the rut of, you know, titles and uh, status signaling as much as possible. But yeah, it's not, uh, it's not super easy, but it starts with, uh, you know, simple steps like reading this book. Tell me, Simone, is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't uh, or any parting thoughts that you have for listeners? No, I, I I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for the thoughtfulness of your questions. And yeah, I, I guess to, to listeners in the audience, the one point that I want to drive home is just about the value of 
diversifying who you are, you know, much as an investor benefits from diversifying the sources of their investments, we too benefit from diversifying the sources of meaning and identity in our lives. And by doing so, I think you will become more well-rounded people and ironically better workers too. Thank you very much. So the book comes out in two weeks. People can catch Simone on Twitter. Do read the book and uh, send us your comments through Amazon or wherever the book is present. Um, hope to see you soon, Simone. The good enough job. Uh, I, I wish you all the very best for it and for every other adventure that you embark upon. Sounds good. You can learn more at thegoodenoughjob.com. Thanks for having me.